Welcome to the real world. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. What you're trying to do? I'm trying to free your mind. By removing Earth from the motionless center of the universe, these masons have moved us physically and metaphysically from a place of supreme importance to one of complete nihilistic indifference. If the earth is the center of the universe, then the ideas of God, creation, and a purpose for human existence are resplendent. But if the earth is just one of billions of planets revolving around billions of stars and billions of galaxies, then the ideas of God, creation, and a specific purpose for earth and human existence become highly implausible. By surreptitiously indoctrinating us into their scientific materialist sun worship, not only do we lose faith in anything beyond the material, we gain absolute faith in materiality, superficiality, status, selfishness, hedonism, and consumerism. If there is no God and everyone is just an accident, then all that really matters is me, me, me. They have turned Madonna, the mother of God, into a material girl living in a material world. Ptolemy shows very ingeniously that the earth must be at the center of the celestial sphere. He proves that unless this were the case, each star would not move with the absolute uniformity which does characterize it. He shows also that the earth could not be animated by any movement of transition. The earth, argued Ptolemy, lies at the center of the celestial sphere. If the earth were to be endowed with movement, it would not lie always at this point. It must therefore shift to some other part of the sphere. The movements of the stars, however, preclude this, and therefore the earth must be as devoid of any movement of translation as it is of rotation. The Ptolemaic geocentric system prevailed for over 1400 years, and even thousands of years before Ptolemy, flat earth geocentricism was the widely accepted truth. The modern ball-earth heliocentricism popularized by the likes of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and NASA, however, is a comparatively recent belief system that has been foisted upon an unsuspecting world for 500 years. Ptolemy never imagined the scientific magicians of the future would be so brazen, nor the public so gullible, as to accept that we see no parallax change in the stars after hundreds of millions of miles of supposed orbital motion, simply because all those stars are trillions upon trillions of miles further distant at a sufficient enough scale for no change in relative parallax to occur. How convenient! Yet another fact of modern astronomy which defies our common sense and experience. Lady Blunt wrote, They expect us to believe that the earth and sea together comprise a flying globe, which they speak of as a solid orb, supposed by astronomers to have been originally shot off the sun in the soft plastic mass, which as the temperature decreased, gradually solidified. Yet not one single fact or proof can they produce for this far-fetched idea, and in spite of the fact that the whirling globe theory was, even according to the open confessions of its founders, set forth to the world in the first instance as a mere supposition, it is now presented as unquestionable truth. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, it was said in effect by Newton, and has ever since been insisted upon by his disciples, allow us, without proof, which is impossible, the existence of two universal forces, centrifugal and centripetal, or attraction and repulsion, and we will construct a theory which shall explain all the leading phenomena and mysteries of nature, an apple falling from a tree, or a stone rolling downwards, and a pail of water tied to a string and set in motion, were assumed to be types of the relations existing among all the bodies in the universe. The moon was assumed to have a tendency to fall towards the earth, and the earth and moon together towards the sun. The same relation was assumed to exist between all the smaller and larger luminaries in the firmament, and it soon became necessary to extend these assumptions to infinity. The universe was parceled out into systems, coexistent and illimitable, 
suns, planets, satellites, and comets were assumed to exist infinite in number and boundless in extent, and to enable the theorists to explain alternating and constantly recurring phenomena which were everywhere observable, these numberless and forever extending objects were assumed to be spheres. The earth we inhabit was called a planet, and because it was thought to be reasonable that the luminous objects in the firmament, which were called planets, were spherical and had motion, so it was only reasonable to suppose, as the earth was a planet, it must also be spherical and have motion, ergo the earth is a globe and moves upon axes. It might also be assumed that under those conditions very high constructions would swerve from the vertical. The American skyscrapers and the Eiffel Tower, for instance, cannot be seen to lean right or left according to the seasons, although this should be a logical and natural consequence of the alternate inclination attributed to the Earth. If the Earth were a sphere that rotated daily on its vertical axis at a uniform velocity, revolving annually around the sun, it would follow that half the globe would always be sunlit, while the other half dark every place on the globe receiving an equal amount of day and night. In actuality, however, the drastically varying lengths of day and night over the Earth are consistent with the geocentric flat Earth model. If the Earth were a sphere, it would follow that the seasons the world over would be simultaneous due to the distance from the sun. When the Earth is farthest away from the sun, the entire globe should be ensconced in winter and recording the coldest temperatures for the year. When the Earth is closest to the Sun, the entire globe should be summery and recording the warmest temperatures for the year. In actuality, however, this is not the case. The frozen depths of Antarctica remain forever frigidly foreboding, while just a few thousand miles away it is tropical summer. How is it that the heat from the Sun could supposedly come from an eyebrow raising 93 million miles away to simultaneously burn the skin of beach bums in Hawaii while leaving Antarctic explorers frozen in their boots just a few thousand miles away? Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, It is geometrically demonstrable that all the visible luminaries in the firmament are within a distance of a few thousand miles from the Earth, not more than the space which stretches between the North Pole and the Cape of Good Hope, and the principle of measurement, that of plane triangulation, with invariably and accurately measured baseline, which demonstrates this important fact, is one which no mathematician claiming to be a master in the science will for a moment deny. All these luminaries, then, and the sun itself, being so near to us, cannot be other than very small as compared with the earth we inhabit. They are all in motion over the earth, which is alone immovable, and therefore they cannot be anything more than secondary and subservient structures continually ministering to this fixed world and its inhabitants. This is a plain, simple, and in every respect demonstrable philosophy agreeing with the evidence of our senses, borne out by every fairly instituted experiment, and never requiring a violation of those principles of investigation which the human mind has ever recognized and depended upon in its everyday life. The modern or Newtonian astronomy has none of these characteristics. The whole system taken together constitutes a most monstrous absurdity. It is false in its foundation, irregular, unfair, and illogical in its details and in its conclusions, inconsistent and contradictory, Worse than all, it is a prolific source of irreligion and of atheism, of which its advocates are practically supporters. By defending a system which is directly opposed to that which is taught in connection with the Jewish and Christian religion, they lead the more critical and daring intellects to question and deride the cosmogony and general philosophy contained in the sacred books. Because the Newtonian theory is held to be true, they are led to reject the scriptures altogether, to ignore the worship and doubt and deny the existence of a creator and supreme ruler of the world. The facts and experiments already advanced render it undeniable that the surface of all the waters of the earth is horizontal, and that however irregular the upper outline of the land itself may be, the whole mass, land and water together, constitutes an immense, non-moving, circular plane. If we travel by land or sea from any part of the earth in the direction of any meridian line and towards the northern central star called Polaris, we come to one and the same place, a region of ice, where the star which has been our guide is directly above us, or vertical to our position. 
This region is really the center of the earth, and recent observations seem to prove that it is a vast central tidal sea nearly a thousand miles in diameter and surrounded by a great wall or barrier of ice eighty to a hundred miles in breadth. If from this central region we trace the outline of the lands which project or radiate from it, and the surface of which is above the water, we find that the present form of the earth or dry land as distinguished from the waters of the great deep is an irregular mass of capes, bays, and islands, terminating in great bluffs or headlands, projecting principally towards the south, or at least in a direction away from the great northern center. If now we sail with our backs continually to this central star Polaris, or the center of the earth's surface, we shall arrive at another region of ice. Upon whatever meridian we sail, keeping the northern center behind us, we are checked in our progress by vast and lofty cliffs of ice. If we turn to the right or to the left of our meridian, these icy barriers beset us during the whole of our passage. Hence we have found that there is a great ebbing and flowing sea at the earth's center with a boundary wall of ice, that springing or projecting from this icy wall, irregular masses of land stretch out towards the south, where a desolate waste of turbulent waters surrounds the continents, and is itself engirdled by vast belts and packs of ice, bounded by immense frozen barriers, the lateral depth and extent of which are utterly unknown. How far the ice extends, how it terminates, and what exists beyond it, are questions to which no present human experience can reply. All we at present know is that snow and hail, howling winds and indescribable storms and hurricanes prevail, and that in every direction human ingress is barred by unsealed escarpments of perpetual ice extending farther than eye or telescope can penetrate and becoming lost in gloom and darkness. What remains unknown at this time are the extent of the Antarctic ice wall, how far can one travel southwards atop the ice, is it just water, snow, ice, and darkness forever? Or is there some limit, like the glass wall in the Truman Show? Is there a limit to space? Is the universe infinite, or as the Bible claims, contained within a physical firmament, the vault of heaven? What exists beneath the mighty deep? Is it just deeper and darker water going downward forever? Or is there some limit? You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake?